Hi everyone, a very warm welcome to you all as we come together on this second Sunday of Lent and hear God invite us to take up our cross and follow him. Before we enter into our time of worship today, I want to share a few announcements with you all about things going on in the life of our congregation. And so as many of you know, we have been raising funds, helping to raise funds for the hot water tanks that need replacing in the Place of Hope apartments. And this replacement will cost about $14,000. And just this week, the session made the decision to match all donations that come into our congregation through the offering that will go out toward this project. And so we are matching those donations. So far, we've received $625, which is really great news. If you do feel called to give toward this project of replacing the water tanks for the Place of Hope Apartments, then you can still do so by marking water tanks on your offering envelope or in your e-transfer. Lorna Law is also collecting some Sunday school supplies for Place of Hope Indigenous Presbyterian Church to support them as they seek to deliver activity packages to the children involved in their program. Lorna is very happy to, to collect craft items such as markers, crayon, construction paper, glue, things like that. And if you would like to donate any items or financially to Place of Hope Indigenous Presbyterian Church Sunday School, then you can do so by contacting Lorna. There will be a, a more full announcement about that coming out in our March newsletter. And our March newsletter and calendar will be coming to your inbox on March 1st, Monday, as we embark together on a new month. And there are lots of ways to get involved in this month of March in the virtual life of our congregation. And so beginning this week on Monday, we will have youth group on Zoom at 7 p.m. And anyone in grades 6 to 12 is always more than welcome to come hang out with us on Zoom in that time. On Tuesday at 1 p.m. on Zoom, we will have the second session of our Lenten study. And this year for our Lenten study, we are journeying through the You Are Never Alone series by Max Lucado. It is a DVD series. I will uh, have the link circulated to the congregation. If you didn't receive it, then let us know at the church and we'll send it to you. And if you are offline, then I do invite you to call in or log in. I will be showing this week's video at 1240 ahead of our discussion at 1. And all are welcome to that. On Wednesday morning at 8 a.m., we will have a short time of morning prayer as we center ourselves on God and bring to him our joys and concerns, and all are welcome to that gathering on Zoom. This uh, Wednesday evening, Ted will be leading a new video series. It's called Unshakable Hope by Max Lucado. He will be leading that on Wednesday evenings through the month of March at 7 p.m., and there will be more info about that coming out in the newsletter this week. And if you are interested in joining in that study by Ted on Wednesday evenings, then you can contact him. And Dave will be continuing to lead his Bible study on the Gospel of Mark this Thursday at 2 p.m. on Zoom. And he will circulate the materials for that and you will find the link in our weekly email. And next Sunday, you are invited to tune in to our YouTube worship as we join together and worship God from the places we are at. And so we gather together today from many different places on this second Sunday of Lent, but we come seeking life in all of its fullness. We gather together in God's name, longing for what is real and true. We gather drawn by the words of our Creator and Redeemer, who calls on us to take up our cross and follow Him. And so let us worship our Lord, who is worthy of all glory and praise. Trusting that God is always listening to us with love, let us pray together. Loving and holy God, our Creator, Christ, and Guide, you speak the words of life to us. In you we find our heart's desire. By your grace we are saved. When the way forward is unclear, you shed light. When we are troubled, you give peace. When times are difficult, you stir courage and hope. 
in these difficult days. We praise you for your faithfulness to us. Draw near to us in our time of worship today, O God, and open the way before us so that we may follow Jesus without wavering, trusting him to lead us. O God, we ask that you would take what is closed in us and open it. Take what is distracted in us and settle it. Take what is hurting in us and hold it. Take any and all parts of us that create distance from you. For we are like Peter, O God. We argue what we don't know and we fear what we cannot see. And we almost always speak sooner than we listen. So open us, settle us, hold us and forgive us, O God. We long to hear you more clearly. We long to know you more fully. With hope we pray, and with gratitude we confess in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of us all. Amen. My friends, we confess with gratitude because we know that God already has heard and forgiven us. No matter what we have done or left undone, we are held in God's hand. So rest in this good news that God invites us in. God meets us right where we are. God hears our prayers and God forgives us. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. And as we gather together for worship on the second Sunday of Lent, I would like to invite Barb to lead us in our Lenten liturgy this day. We are not the first to make the journey to Jerusalem. Many have gone before us and many will come after us. From near and far, God's people gather to celebrate God's goodness on the holy mountain. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus often went to Jerusalem as a, as a child to celebrate Passover. Now he has set his face towards Jerusalem again, knowing this time will be different. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus' last journey to Jerusalem is somber, and he has no illusion about what is to come. Still, he goes ahead, doing God's will. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Let us pray. God of light, we want to follow in Jesus' footsteps, but we have our fears and doubts. We would rather avoid the pain and darkness on our journey. Give us courage and perseverance when the journey is difficult and the grace to help others on the road. And we, in the name of Jesus, we pray.
Let us go to God, seeking his wisdom and understanding. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you with bowed heads and hopeful hearts, asking that through your spirit, you would lend us your ears. Help us to hear as you hear, so that we can live as you lived and seek to pick up our cross as we follow you on our journey in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Reading from Mark 8, 27 to 38. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Jesus and his disciples went out into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do men say I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. He warned them then that they should tell no one about him. And Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. When he had called the people to him with his disciples, he said to them, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever would lose his life for me, for my sake, and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Whoever therefore is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God. Amen. Throughout the Gospels, we come to understand Peter as a representative of the disciples, sort of like a spokesperson for the group. Our passage today begins with Peter's declaration of who Jesus is. Peter has just rightly declared Jesus as the Messiah, but Peter will not linger all that long on this plateau of spiritual insight. Indeed, he also goes on to misunderstand Jesus' predictions about his death, even silencing Jesus out of shock. And then later, Peter denies his Lord and deserts him in his time of greatest need. Peter's life is very realistic and relatable for us as followers of God so many generations later. Our faith is full of starts and stops, ups and downs. We have moments of great faith and also moments of great doubt. We have moments of progress, success and achievement and others of disappointment and regression. But what remains constant for Peter is Jesus, always there, always with us, and always asking the question, who do you say that I am? And then also providing the answer, 
not through words or even instruction, but through his very life, ministry, and ultimately his death on the cross. So Jesus sticks with Peter, even in his misunderstanding, and still calls him on this great journey of discipleship. When Jesus rebukes Peter in our passage today, Jesus is not challenging whether or not he is the Messiah. We know he is the Messiah. Rather, Jesus is challenging Peter's very idea of a Messiah. Yes, Jesus is a Messiah, but not the kind of Messiah Peter was imagining. This could be why Jesus tells them to keep quiet about his identity as the Messiah, because it is all too easy to misunderstand what Messiah means. Too often, we project onto God what we want God to be. But when we do that, we risk missing what God has actually done and what God is doing. Peter's human idea of the Messiah is someone who comes with royal triumph. They thought Jesus, their Messiah, would come to raise up an army and overthrow Rome. But for Jesus, being the Messiah meant suffering, even to the point of physical death. Jesus' version of the Messiah wasn't someone who would overthrow the nations with brutal violence. Rather, he was the bringer of peace and an advocate for those on the margins. Jesus the Messiah opposed the very worldly evil and imperial power that oppressed him. Jesus is the Messiah, the one who will reveal the kingdom of God a true kingdom and power. But part of this power is sacrifice. After Jesus corrects Peter's notion of his identity as the Messiah, he also gives a sacrificial call to discipleship. Jesus says to the crowd around him and also to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now I can't help but wonder about the awkward tension among the crowd as these words pass from the mouth of Jesus as he takes the most despised and rejected symbol of his time and says, if you want to follow me, take this up. Now I know I've shared with you a while back the illustration from Kyle Eidelman about fans versus followers of Jesus. Eidelman says that fans are like enthusiastic admirers who want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires sacrifice. Fans don't want to break a sweat or get dirty. Just wear the jersey and cheer comfortably from the sidelines. We live in a social media dominated world, and so we are becoming all too familiar with the idea of following someone. But this social media culture has turned us into passive followers. In the social media world, we can find someone famous or inspirational and then click follow so that we can see their Facebook, their Twitter, or their Instagram account. And then we can see what they are doing and how they are living their lives, at least a filtered version of their daily living. But Jesus isn't issuing a call for fans to passively watch him, watch what he is doing, and cheer him on from the sidelines. Rather, Jesus is calling followers to follow him 
by taking up their cross and engaging with the messy, broken parts of our world. Notice how he didn't choose a dove, a sign of peace, a shepherd's staff, a sign of protection, or even a rainbow, as we know to be a sign of God's hope and promise. Instead, he chose the cross. It is so significant that Jesus chose the symbol of the cross as the weight we must bear in this earthly life. The cross, as we know, is a symbol of torture and death, a means of execution that the Romans used to force people into submission. The cross was a sign of humiliation, a public statement that this person has no power and ultimately is nothing. Just think of Jesus' experience. He was hung on the cross naked, spit on, and even mocked. The cross was also a sign of suffering. The Roman soldiers would beat criminals beyond recognition, just like they did to Jesus. Only after this beating were the large wooden beams placed on the open wounds oozing from his back. The cross was ultimately a sign of death. Jesus' hands and feet were nailed to the cross, nailed into these wooden beams he carried on his oozing back. He even had a spear thrust into his side to confirm his death on that cross. My friends, as you can see, you can't take Jesus up on his offer, his invitation to take up your cross, to pick up your lot in life and follow him and expect not to suffer in this earthly life. You just can't carry a cross without suffering. Taking up your cross and following Jesus can and will bring pain and suffering. And what is perhaps even more daunting is that Jesus invites us as we take up our cross, our lot in this life, to die to ourselves. As the great theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he tells us to take up our cross. The take indicates to us that dying is a choice we make when we take up our cross. Now, this is not how we typically think about death. We think of it as something we don't choose, something that happens most often against our will. So this invitation from Jesus to deny ourselves, to come and die and take up our cross does seem counterintuitive. It just doesn't feel right to our human minds, much like Peter in our text today. But Jesus is not alluding to our natural, physical death. Here is what Jesus means. When we die to ourselves, we do so to our own desires, our own pursuits, and our own plans. When we become followers of Jesus, that is the end of us. When we are dead to ourselves, we don't care what other people think of us, just what God thinks of us. When we are dead, we don't care what our clothes look like, how nice the things are that we have, how much money we have, or how many promotions we've received. When we come and die to ourselves, when we deny ourselves and take up our cross, we are no longer concerned with our own life, but rather it is the ultimate surrender of yourself and all that you have. 
as you seek to serve God and help bring about his kingdom. Thanks to the gift of the Holy Spirit, we embody Jesus' message, his teachings, and his very way of life. Jesus came to show us how to live, and we deny ourselves and our own ways so that we can truly live into the way he has modeled for us. It is important to note that the pain and the suffering we experience in our earthly lives is not an indication that we are not following Jesus. Just because we are all his fearfully and wonderfully made followers doesn't mean this life will unfold smoothly and comfortably. When you say yes to Jesus and truly follow him, you are agreeing to carry a cross and that will be painful at times. But my friends, it will also be so worth it as we follow Jesus even to the place he is preparing for us to dwell in eternity with him. When I was working on this sermon, I, I took a bit of a break to go run some errands. And at one store, I spotted those snuggy blankets that were quite a hit in recent years. If you haven't seen these snuggies before, they are basically like a big blanket with sleeves so that your arms can go in the sleeves and keep yourself as warm and cozy and comfortable as you would like. Now when I saw them, I couldn't help but stop to think about how much easier it would be if Jesus told us to pick up an object of comfort, such as a Snuggie, and follow him all warm and cozy in our blanket. We are comfort seekers not cross bearers. A warm, fluffy, all-encompassing blanket like a Snuggie represents ease and comfort, whereas a cross represents pain and sacrifice. C.S. Lewis has written, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. When we also, like C.S. Lewis, come to Christianity, we are not exactly seeking out personal happiness, for such a thing is and will forever be fleeting. Rather, when we come to Christianity, when we come to Jesus and become a follower of him, we are seeking to be a part of something so much bigger and greater than ourselves as we take up our cross and live into the ways of Jesus, seeking the good for all, loving all those who cross our path, and advocating to make this world into the just place it was intended to be. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to have the same attitude, the same mindset as Jesus, who made himself nothing. He, who had the world at his feet, chose to come and wash the feet of this world. If we are going to follow Jesus, it means humbly taking up a cross and making ourselves nothing. My friends, this Lenten season, I pray that as we grow into more faithful disciples, we will move from being fans to followers of Jesus as we take up our crosses, our lot in life together, and follow him. Now this is undeniably quite a challenge, one of those things that is much easier said than done. Carrying our cross to follow Jesus is going to cost us. There will be sacrifice involved, and you're going to feel at least a little bit uncomfortable. 
but there is a promise in this challenge. The promise is that as we are bearing our cross in this world, we are not stumbling around under the weight, trying desperately to find our own way. Rather, we are following Jesus. He is the one who is organizing the journey ahead. We just need to take up our lot in life and follow him. Now he might lead us to places we don't like. He will lead us through global pandemics, through the grief of losing loved ones, through physical and mental illness, through broken relationships, financial struggles, among many other heartbreaks, all of which cause us to feel wounded. But my friends, he will lead us if only we will follow. He will strengthen us and give us the perseverance as we continue on, bearing the weight of our cross on the open wounds of our backs. For he promises to never leave us nor forsake us. And so, as we continue in our journey this Lenten season, let us take up our cross and follow Jesus into the way of true and everlasting life. Amen. joys and concerns this day. Let us join together in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the vision you have for our lives, the promises you have made to us, and the journey you open before us. Today, we remember with gratitude the ways our lives are held secure in uncertain times by our trust in you moments in these months of pandemic that made us laugh or smile. Moments when we felt your gifts of courage and patience. Times when you helped us to overcome temptation and the people who love us and give us encouragement. Gracious God, we are grateful for all these signs of your love in our lives. We thank you for the hope and the joy you bring us. Show us how to share this hope, joy, and love with others who are struggling especially in these difficult days. Faithful God, we pray for healing and restoration in this world that is our home. Hear us now, O oh God, as we name and silence the needs and concerns we carry today. We pray for people, places, and situations deeply in need of your grace, especially as they face fears and frustrations of coping with COVID. We pray for those who struggle to feed clothe or house themselves and their families, and for all who worry about their economic future. We 
We pray for those who are weak or vulnerable for any reason, and for all who lack dignity and respect in our community. We pray for the earth and its well-being, that areas and species under threat will be cared for. We pray for peace with justice in regions of the world facing turmoil. And we pray for all those offering leadership and service in these times of hope and anxiety, for those planning how to offer vaccines in our community, and for those uncertain about vaccination. By the power of your spirit, O oh God, work in us and through us. May we bring the light and love of your kingdom into our relationships and our community in all we say and do. Receive our prayers this day in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as we go from our time of worship to take up our cross and follow Jesus on the journey he is organizing for us, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and always. Amen. Amen.